runners, get to your positions because it's time for another episode of We Run This. Today, we're talking to runner and coach Ryan Knapp. Ryan has over 20 years of coaching experience with a main focus on mountain, ultra, and trail running. He's been featured in Trail Running Magazine, Runner's World, CNN, and on the Daily Burn, and was asked by the Roadrunners Club of America to create their Level 2 Ultra Running Curriculum to help coaches around the world learn how to coach ultra runners. Ryan talked to Nick and I about moving his entire family to Germany for work, getting comfortable running in another country, training for 100-mile races, the depression that sometimes comes with finishing an ultra run, and how runners can tell that they're ready to try an ultra. This episode of We Run This is sponsored by Tempo, dedicated to giving people nonstop energy, superior strength, and incomparable confidence. Tempo supplements guarantee you'll never miss a beat thanks to its special formulation of natural ingredients and essential nutrients made with only the safest standards. There are two versions of Tempo. Hungover AF, a natural alcohol hangover supplement, and F Coffee, a non-tropic supplement for clarity and focus. Check out both at meettempo.com. Find your rhythm with Tempo. So without further ado, We Run This presents Ryan Knapp. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another edition of We Run This. I am Chris Illuminati. With me, as always, is Nick Domingo. Nick, what's up, brother? Not much, dude. How about yourself? Uh, same old, same old. You're still stuck in Canada, huh? Still stuck in Canada. Here for a couple more days, you know, riding it out. Nice. Well, I have good news and bad news. The good news is you're no longer the farthest person that's joining us on the podcast because our guest today is Ryan Knapp, and he's coming to us from Germany. Which is insane. <laughs> yeah, what's up, Ryan? How you doing, man? I'm doing fantastic. How about you guys? Thanks so much for having me on. Thanks for coming on. So our first question, I'm sure you get asked a thousand times, how the hell did you end up in Germany? Yeah, so uh, we've been here about a year and a half now. Uh, my wife is uh, a consultant, uh, so we're both, we're both American. We have two young kids. They're American as well. And she um, left the job she's working in the U.S. and had an opportunity to move over here and work for a company. So April 2019, we uh, took a chance and came over here to Germany. I used to live in Spain. I lived there twice. And so like my good friends lived there. So it was a great opportunity to get closer to them and and just come back to Europe. My wife had never lived here. And so we just wanted to take advantage of it. So here we are. Dude, that's awesome. I mean, I have to ask the obvious question, like, how's COVID over there? I mean, are you guys doing okay compared to what the States is? (laughs) here i mean to be all completely honest like uh we so um things got a little crazy kind of when italy and everything happened um and we ended up being able to into that before it came over to the u.s but we were never fully shut down or anything so we could we couldn't do anything but we always could go out and run or exercise like that was always a thing um and the way that the laws are just here with uh protection we were able to get on like a little bit more part-time work when the kids were home and and that so we were able to the the government here you know not getting into it but does a really good job kind of of supporting everything so it was pretty well put uh, pretty well put together so things are pretty fine here now i mean our town wasn't really hit bad um but we're all still able to like work from home and that sort of stuff but kids are back in school and and all and and that so uh it's, it's a little bit different than also smaller so you're able to manage it a little bit more Nice. Well, I'm glad to hear that. That's for sure. Yeah. Is, is, is there, there's no end date. Like you're going to be there forever how long the jobs are, right? Yeah, we, we are an indefinite contract. So we're um, legal German residents. So uh, my wife got the job and then the fa- we kind of come under what's called family reunification. So mm-hmm. then I, and I now work for a, about, so we're kind of Southern central Germany. So I work for a startup in it's like 45 minutes from here so i have a full-time job so the government really likes me and my wife works full-time so we're all legal residents so we can basically stay as long as we want we just have to renew our resident permit every three years Uh, so your job brought you to germany yeah so uh, my wife got a job and uh we moved here like a year and a half ago got 
uh, residence permit, so we're all good. So she works as a consultant, and then I work up the road, and so we're able to basically stay here as long as we want. We can, um, yeah, we're indefinite. So we're just basically riding it out as long as we want to go. We love the town that we live in. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It's super awesome. There's beer garden. You can throw, I mean, my favorite brewery, I could literally throw two baseballs and hit it, and then you could hit another 20 around us. Like, so it's just wow. a great, it's a great town to live in and great place. So we're here for the foreseeable future and love it. I, I want to get back to that brewery thing, but the first question that I yeah. thought of uh, when you were talking about it, do people kind of like look at you funny because they know you're American? And so like, what, what are you doing there? <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's because we don't speak German uh, yet. It's, we're, we're learning as much as we can. My four-year-old speaks pretty well, um, mm -hmm. and my two-year-old is learning, and, and he could, they can definitely understand. But the benefit for us was there was an American military base here for years. It closed mm -hmm. in 2012. And actually, my son's school is but the kid's school is right across the street from it. So it's funny because you see like American mechanics, there's like a sub shop that sells like Dr. Pepper and all of these things like when the base was around. So they're pretty used to Americans in our town, which works out well. Um, but we definitely get some looks like, or just like, why are you here? Like, what are yeah. you doing here? Are you hiding? Do you have yeah, COVID? Yeah. Do you have yeah. COVID well, or are you hiding? And we travel. We traveled to a couple of places during. We we went to Italy a couple of weeks ago, and we had like our American passports, and everyone's like looking. We're like, no, like we live in Germany, so we had to always carry our residence permit to basically back it up behind us because they're like, how are you here? And it's like, well, we live here. <laughs> nice. nice. Um, so more on the beer garden stuff. Yeah. What's your favorite German beer that you're drinking on the regular? Um, it's a brew. There's so where we live in basically Franconia and, and like the area is um, it's huge. There's actually a, one of the biggest malt factories in like Germany and that a lot of U.S. companies source from is maybe a quarter mile from here. And you can smell it like when they're actually working, like you can smell the malt. So like it's, it's super, it's super crazy. There's a brewery down the, down behind me called Fessler. And that's like my favorite. But the thing is um, in Germany, like you can go to the grocery store wherever you are in Germany, like even right before you get on the train and right next to the checkout will be like a cooler and it'll have like 99 cent for half a liter beer of basically what's around that area. And it's always good like oh, super, super and you can just drink wherever so like we drink on the train like if we're traveling somewhere you can grab beer wine and just drink like you can just walk around the street and drink it like no one cares you can take it wherever so there's just amazing um breweries here and then there's also things called kellers which are which means basement but it's like beer gardens but they have um they serve a little bit of food and they have um playgrounds for the kids so like they're like these incredible playgrounds in the forest and you, we ride our bikes out like 10 miles and then they're just in the middle of the forest and they have these like huge like brewery beer gardens and they brew all their own beer and make like all this homemade food and the kids are just like climbing in the trees and stuff and it's super cool but like you just get the beer there and it's incredible like everywhere you go so <laughs> sounds like heaven what? yeah it really is if you like beer this is the place to be <laughs> why can't americans do this like are we just dumb like why yep is that what it is? Like, <laughs> yeah. solid, legit the first answer. Time we came to German, the first time we came here was when my wife interviewed. So we came here for three weeks, um, right in February before she got hired in April, because they had like they had her come in person and do this day long like interview process. So we're like, let's come to Germany for three weeks and see if we like it. If we don't move, we leave Germany for three weeks. The first time we went to the playground, like down the street, it has a kiosk, which is basically like a a restaurant next to it but like takeaway and you can get beer wine drinks food whatever so like we're sitting in the playground everyone's drinking beer and the kids are just playing and we're like if this was in the u.s like there would have been a fight like there'll be yeah. a fight like they'll have a like that's what'll happen is like some dad will get drunk some uh -huh. mom will start swearing at him and then they'll get in a fight and like it'll be over and then like they'll just take it away because we looked at each other and we're like why can't we have this but <laughs> that's what we think is like it would it's just different. It's different here. It's, it's hard to say, and you, you don't want to be like, this is better, but like, it's just the way it is and the way people view it. Like, it's not a big deal. And yeah, that's I why feel like have like crazy things like that, which would just in the U S would be like unheard of. I, I feel like part of that is because in other cultures, when you say stuff like that, like drinking is kind of not ingrained to them, but you start learning young what yeah. drinking is. But for us here, it's like, you can't touch that until you're 21. Yeah. And, then and when something is forbidden for so long, right. And the people don't know how to like handle it. So when it's yeah. like that, like 
okay, your kids are at a beer garden. They understand what's going on when they're yeah, younger like, and they get like, oh, okay, you can kind of do this and be responsible and like, yeah. but we like just take things yeah, to the extreme. It's just around, I mean, and certainly like there's a university here and like kids get lit. Like don't, we like mm-hmm. don't like, right. <laughs> but right. it's just a little bit different. I mean, I live, I grew up in Niagara Falls, New York. Like when I, when I turned 19, we drove to Canada. We like, <laughs> literally drove six miles and went over the border <laughs> and drank it and then we'd come home. So like you, right. you did it because you just had to, but it's yeah. it's just a different um, mentality here. But the and the thing that happens in Germany is people police themselves. So if someone's doing something stupid, the entire collective of people will call the person out that's doing something stupid and like make it stop. Mm. So Karens stop don't exist. Life. Karens do not exist in Germany. Yeah, it's, <laughs> they, you don't see them like there's there's like they're very passive aggressive here. Like our neighbors don't really like us, and they're just super passive aggressive and things. So like there's a different <laughs> way to be a Karen here than, than in the U.S. where it's they a little bit more overt. Make you but, feel bad about yourself. <laughs> yeah, like the first day we moved here, they were like yelling at us about the compost, and we literally lived here like an hour and a half, and we're like, we didn't do, it. We didn't do this. Like I don't know why. So. It's an interesting, a, def- a different way to be uh, a Karen. So do, do they say do they say stuff to you when you run by? Do they like? Uh... Yeah, they just they just say shit to us like when we're here. <laughs> so <laughs> nice. they don't really care. Nice. They'll just kind of tell you to your face. But it's um it's 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 an interesting way to learn. I mean, we're just thrown right into it, so we mm-hmm. learn just about the culture from from being here. But we work in, we both work in international offices too. So like uh, our best friends from here are like Italian and they have two young kids and, and friends from, we had a th- we had Thanksgiving here last year for like American Thanksgiving and we had like 16 nationalities here, like 35 people in our little house and we just cooked Thanksgiving dinner and just had people from all over. So you really get to, to learn about it. Cool. That's so cool. Yeah. Speaking of running, yeah, what, running. <laughs> like, like talk to me about, you know, what, if any, the difference is between running in Germany, running here, whether it's the elements, whether it's the past, whether it's, you know, there's some sort of socially uh, acceptable thing where, you you know, you run in bigger groups as opposed to running yourself. Like, give us yeah. a little bit of detail about, uh, you know, running over there in Germany compared to the U.S. Yeah. So, like, where, where we live specifically, um, we live near a big canal that basically that goes for, you know, like, hundreds of miles. So, there's a bike path. Know, less than a quarter mile outside of my house and I can run on a bike path until I basically die before I hit the end mm-hmm. um so like people and people at least here in Bamberg specifically the town we live in are really active and in this area it's really active so everyone just go especially during COVID like there are loads of people out for runs but there's always people out for runs or or going out in groups and even doing like longer walks and things especially like older people so people are definitely doing it for the um for the like health benefit of it, but they do like to run in groups as well. They're they're basically called berlins, which is like um uh, like social clubs. So you would join like similar to like a track club or something in the U.S. Like you can join one for running, and then there's like younger kids up to adults, and they're kind of running together and doing more training. Um, people tend to run in like twos or threes, not like huge huge training groups. You see a lot of people running together, and when we go for runs with my friends, it's usually like two or three of us, and 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 go out and be able to to do that. And it's super social. People are just hanging out and, and having a good time and really, um, really enjoying it. You can get up in the trails and stuff around here. Um, within like four or five miles, we live in it basically it's it's called Franconia in Switzerland or um, Tuscany. So it's uh, Franconia in Switzerland is actually really close too. But it's it's like if you go about four or five miles, you can go over this hill in a valley, and it looks like Tuscany. Like that's what it's called. It's called like the Tuscany of, of Franconia. So you can run trails and you can just run out in the woods for as long as you basically want. So there's just gorgeous um, gorgeous paths to be able to to do and a lot of people do something called um nordic walking which is basically like hiking but with poles like serious so like you'll see these groups of people like on the bike path and they have poles and they're just like going at it but then they train they do it a lot and then they go for like day they go for like three four five day long hikes in the alps and stuff and they get like super into it so the ones that can't run like go out in big groups and they kind of walk but like they're all out doing stuff in in their own way that's cool what's the uh what's the difference in you know like there's like a running culture in the mm-hmm. united states what's the difference between the cultures of running here and there yeah it's i think at least from my experience you don't see, 
in the U.S., there's a big push for running now, especially during COVID. But even even I would say since I started coaching full time, like 2010, um, there was kind of like in that area, there was like a big resurgence, especially when ultra running started to come around um, that really pushed kind of running forward. So in Germany, you don't it's not as um, I would say uh, it's not as like everyone it's not something like everyone wants to do it and wants to do it it's like culturally cool to do it like mm -hmm. people just kind of do it because because they do it and it's just like a, a thing to do whereas in the u.s it's a lot of um like joining bigger groups and kind of doing it and being a part of something like november project like these sort of big things like at least in the towns where we are in the smaller town where we are that sort of stuff isn't kind of isn't around as uh, as much so to say mm -hmm. I know you mentioned ultras and, and endurance races. You talked to us before, obviously, about endurance races and, and how that's kind of your specialty. You know, what's the longest race you've ever run? I've run, I've attempted three 100 mile races. I finished two. And then I DNF, I DNF the last one that I did, which I arguably was horrifically under trained for. And it, it, but it started like outside of my front door. <laughs> so I was like, well, I can't not try. Like it's literally, <laughs> <laughs> I DNF'd and I, I DNF'd my wife picked me up and I was home in like seven minutes. So it wasn't like a bad thing to do. <laughs> well, okay. So you said you didn't finish, but like how long into the hundred did you get? Did you get like to like 60, 80? You no, know, like 60 something. It wasn't, we were living in the upper peninsula in Michigan. Um, that's where my wife's from. And that's where we lived before we moved here. And I just knew the terrain, like going back, uh, like where it was and my knee was just kind of shot. And, and I knew I wasn't going to cause like any sort of injury. Like I probably admittedly just like wussed out, but I'm like, do I really want to hike for like 40 miles? Like, and I'm not super trained for this. Like, eh, probably not. So I was just like, I think I'll just call it a call it a day. Uh, but my wife was like, you should have quit when I was there. And I didn't like, <laughs> talk, talk us through that internal conversation of quitting. Like how long yeah. did it last? I mean, it was going on for a while. I just, I knew, like, I went out just like a, like a big a-hole basically. And I knew mm -hmm. the pace I didn't go out at. And, and then it got in the night and it kind of got cold and I, my knee was bothering me. And I was like, ah, I just don't really feel like, feel like doing this anymore. I mean, for me specifically, like having run and having coached, like, if you don't want to do it, the mind is just so powerful to be able to do it. And I just wasn't in it from the beginning. For me too, personally, I know I didn't train like basically well up to the event at all. So when you don't prepare for something, you're just not as into it as much. And it's not as, um, as gratifying, even if you do finish, it's not as gratifying to go out and be a martyr and like drag your broken body across the line just because like you can do it. There's like a gratification in like doing all the work and getting up early and doing what needs to be done and then getting to the start line. Because then you're like, I did all this stuff for like 20 weeks. Like I'm not throwing this away. Whereas when I quit that one, I was like, I'm just throwing this away, but I'm not throwing anything away that I did. Like I literally just rolled up and, and, and went to run it because it was there, you know? But Bro, like the, you, did, you did more than two full half marathons. You do not have to explain yourself yeah. on, yeah. On, on wanting to quit at mile 60 something. Yeah. Yeah. I mean the, the hundred, so the second hundred mile race I did uh, is this race called Cruel Jewel. It's in um, Northern, uh, it's basically North of Atlanta, like about two miles, like, or two miles, like two hours, kind of in the, the Smoky Mountain-ish area, a little bit south. Um, and that race has like 30, more than 30,000 feet of elevation gain and more than 30,000 feet of elevation loss. It took me like just over, uh, it was like 36 hours to do it. Um, and like, I didn't sleep. Like I basically ran the whole thing and like, I trained my butt off for that race. Like I just, we had, I had just had my son. He was like nine months old at the time. I used to put him in a hiking backpack and go up and down like a 200 foot hill behind my house. And I would do it for like three, four hours at a time with him in the hiking backpack. I'd hike in the hiking backpack on a treadmill at like 15%. Like, so I like trained hard for that thing. So I wasn't quitting. Like I was literally dragging my body across the finish line if I had to in that one, because like I had just put so much into it, you know, but that race, then it was, that race was like for the last five hours, it was pouring. Like we literally thought we might die at some point because the wind was so bad and the lightning was so bad that like the trees, our tree was going to fall on us. Like it was just crazy. <laughs> but that, and that's an, that I knew I put in the work and I'm like, I'm out here. Like, I'm just going to get it done no matter kind of what happens. Walk us through, uh, what does it feel like we've heard it, I've heard a bunch of times from um, professional athletes and people that do this kind of thing. Uh, like uh, I think of like Peyton Manning, guys like that. Like once this big thing is over and you have nothing else to train for, 
like you kind of get into this like depression did you yeah. have that after training yeah. mm -hmm. absolutely especially because then you're just like okay i did the thing like it's done like what are you going to do next or like how can you how can you top it so to say you know and and then you have to and then what happens at least in in my mind too like even even if i get a time like in complete honesty now or like the last couple months i haven't been doing much you think about like what you've been able to do or like, Oh, all right. So I'm not going to run a hundred miles. It doesn't matter. Like, cause I really like to do half marathons, like on the road, like road half marathons are like really fun for me because mm -hmm. I just really enjoy them. But then you think like, Oh, it's a half. It's not a hundred miles. It doesn't work the same. So like you kind of have these, these things where you're trying to judge like how hard something is or what you've done. And then I think plays in, into it, at least for me, where it's like, Okay, you have to do the next thing and the next thing and that that from and then stepping back and putting my coach hat on you have to deal with that with your athletes too and the athletes that i coach is like all right get them out of that and figure out like what is the next thing that they want to do and start kind of rolling rolling towards it um because if not you you do end up in like a depression or a funk and it, and it can be hard to to get out of it's always easier to keep the ball rolling and then once the the, the you know the stone stops or the ball stops then you have to start it back up again and the starting it back up again is is usually the hardest part. So I have a couple questions. I'll, I'll, I'll stick with the, the ultra, Ask you know, with, <laughs> after your injury, how did you, how long did you take off from running? And when was it at a point where you said to yourself, all right, you know, I think you said it was your knee, right? That was kind yeah. of busted. When did you feel comfortable again to get back on the road and, and ease back into it? Because it sounds like that was kind of the big gap you needed, right? Like, you had done all these ultra marathons and you're like, eh, whatever. Like, do you have that push and motivation now to be like, all right, here's the race I want to do, whether it's 50, hundred mm -hmm. miles, I feel comfortable. I'm going to work towards that. Yeah. The, the knee thing was a pretty quick fix in all honesty, because I knew it was just like dumb overuse thing that was just coming from that. I was a little worried it was something more, but then the next, like a couple hours and the next day I was like, ah, this is just going to take a couple weeks to really feel okay. So more like it ended up my body just was shattered because I hadn't trained so much. So like my quads are just a freaking mess. My calves are a mess. So it took probably a good month to two months to like really feel okay after it because I just had put my body through something that I wasn't really prepared for, even though I had done stuff before. Um, and, it, and it's a, a misconception too. When you think about ultras and people think the, the hard ones are really these ones, but the ones that you have to put all the work in that are more relatively flat or are, are deceptively like that can still kick your, can still basically kick your butt. Um, so it was like a couple months and then I just started running again and, and felt pretty good. And then that was pretty close to the transition of then like coming here. The thing about where we were living too in the upper peninsula of Michigan was it snows a lot like hundred, like we get more than a hundred inches of snow easy. Um, so then once the snow comes, it's pretty sketch to run, like even on the, where we live, cause the snow banks are too high and cars can't see around. So you end up like snowshoeing a lot and doing things outside. So you kind of have to shift. Whereas at least here in Germany, like, I mean, in my house, it snowed like a half an inch last year. Like, I mean, it's, it's uncommon for it. So somewhere like here, like I can continue to, to keep running. So after that race, it kind of, I've kind of, been doing little things here or there but you know ready to to get into a little bit more now that we're a little bit more settled in germany and, and really push at it again i think it's awesome what are, what are some of the indicators that like the average runner should maybe give an endurance run a shot like what should a person look for as far as their own runs to say you know what maybe i should try like if they have an interest in it if the, it, to stepping up to like an ultra yeah or even just like maybe like a 50 mile or something you know yeah yeah. So the biggest thing in coaching that I look for is, is consistency. Um, and, and when, when an athlete wants to, to step up and do something, if they're consistent in their running, that's a huge thing because the body loves consistency. It doesn't love to run 10 miles and then run no miles for the rest of the week and then run 10 miles. Like it wants to run two miles. So you would rather run three miles, four miles, three miles, four miles, five miles, because then if you're consistent, you can just add on a little bit of mileage. So even if they're not running big miles, if they're super consistent, their body is used to running. Then you can just add the stimulus on a little bit, um, little by little, and you can increase that and be able to, to do it. Uh, and then you have to look, when you start looking at that, you want to look at the time basically involved and what they can possibly do. I have seven hours a week to train. I have four kids. I have this and that and the other thing. Okay, so we have to keep all those things in mind when you're really looking to step up to an event, especially 
if I live in, in Bumberg now and it's pretty flat roughly, and I want to go do some crazy race in the mountains, like the training is very different. So you have to be able to, to uh, train in a similar location or at least with similar thoughts in mind in terms of specificity to be able to, to finish the race. Um, you know, you can't do a race like Leadville that has like 20,000 feet of gain if you live in like Florida. I mean, you can, but it's a lot harder to do that than if you did something that was maybe a little bit more flat or a little bit um, more uh, suited to what you're used to used to running. Um, I used to always joke that like I was Ryan Destroyer of Dreams when I coached because I was really frank with the people that I coached. Like, I don't know if this is necessarily a good idea because um, I think you you have to be really committed and, and willing to take that next step. But for some people, I just think that's the best idea. I think if you can maintain that consistency, then it becomes better and better. Um, it's not that people shouldn't go do it. It's just that, you know, they can uh, take a little bit more time and, and then be able to, to make that step up. But if you can make those steps in increments, 50 K 50 mile, it makes a lot more sense than just say like, I'm going to go to a hundred mile and, and, you know, screw the world. <laughs> So you actually segued into my second question that I had mentioned, and it's how do you differentiate between Ryan the runner and Ryan the coach? Because that's got to be really difficult for you out running, you know, 100 mile ultras and then pushing. However, I don't know the age group that you're you're coaching. Sure. I imagine they're teenage, high school kind they're of. They're kind of all over the place. <laughs> yeah. And so you're, you know, now having to say to them, look, I don't expect you to go out and run 100 miles but i do as you said consistency i do expect you to have that every single day so talk uh, talk to us a little bit about that it's hard to be ryan the coach when ryan the runner isn't doing a lot and mm -hmm. and that because you kind of feel like a hypocrite a little bit like i'm sending these people out to do it and i'm not really doing it and that sort of stuff so those those two things are kind of intertwined like when my coaching business was the biggest back when i was living in boston in like 2015 like i was coaching I, I, I just coached myself. It was just my own business. And I had like more than 50 people I was coaching one-on-one, -on -one, but like I was running a ton, like it was super into it. Then the, when I had kids and started to get out of the running myself a little bit, it becomes a little bit harder to, to identify in terms of, of the coaching side of things. So those two are really intertwined. Um, but what I would always tell people when they would, people would inevitably be interested about my running. And I'm like, I can tell you about my running because I've done stuff, but like, here's the people that I've worked with that do really well. Because it's even like you look at sports, there's there's people like Bill Belichick and they're like, they didn't play. I mean, they're okay, but like, and they played, and even in soccer in Europe, like you look at some of these coaches, like they were okay players, but they're great coaches. So like, I can hang my hat on what I do as a coach and I can separate those things, but it, they do they do have a, a way to, to sort of want to keep themselves uh, together when you're trying. Because with the people I do coach, are like you and Chris. Like I just coach normal people. I coach some people that are real fast. I coach some people that are real slow. I coach some people that go real long. I coach some people go real short. So there's a, a lot of different uh, different people and different groups that that I work with. Um, but if, as long as I can show them that I'm invested in them as a coach, then even if I'm not doing so much on the running side, they understand that that's what I'm there for. Is there a difference in coaching Americans and coaching Germans and? any other yeah so I've, I've had the opportunity to coach people from all around the world um sweden hong kong uh spain like all over the place um different but not i mean different sometimes in the approach and things that they look to do but um yeah people that are super committed are are really are really committed and are and are ready to to go after it so sometimes explanations and things they want to be coached a little bit differently and some expectations but other than that uh, super super it's super cool to be able to to do that one of the things i love that i coach lots of people i mean i mentioned sweden i coached a guy daniel there for years and he's still a good friend of mine like we talk all the time uh and we just become good friends and i've been able to have those relationships with with people and and, and enjoy that so i think if you run and you're from and you run and you love to run you could really show up anywhere in the world and find some people that run and just kind of run alongside them and, and really have that have a connection right away with just being able to do that i think that's a really neat thing about it so three quick tips as from ryan the runner and ryan the competitor you know for someone like chris and i or if you're coaching that you yeah. say forget speed but yeah we want to increase distance because the speed will come as you, you train. So give us three quick tips that you would, you'd give us to, to increase our distance on a regular basis. I mean, the biggest thing to, to repeat myself is consistency. That's one, like making sure you're running 
as often as you possibly can and as much as you possibly can. Um, and, and you want to vary those runs too. So you're on six miles every day. You want to, you know, run maybe four today and eight tomorrow and seven the next day, like keep it a little bit, um, like bury those things. But if you can stay consistent, that always wins instead of going out for a 20 miler and hurting yourself, like go for 10. And if you go for 10 and you're consistent and running 10, you're going to be a lot better than going long and then ending up with an injury. The second basically is 80, 20, 80% of your runs are easy. 20% of your runs are not easy. Easy is a conversational pace. Roughly, we should be able to have a similar conversation like this if you, if all three of us were running next to each other. Um, and then 20% of your runs should be not easy. Um, hard, moderate, kind of in that wheelhouse, but you can do something that's a little bit different. But you have to really regulate yourself on those easy runs in order to be able to, to run long. And, and, and there are lots of physiological things that happen when you run easy, but you also can't neglect the running fast part because running fast is actually... Um, is, is actually a skill to be able to run at a fast pace and be able to do that. You have to teach your body how to run at a fast pace. And the third thing is, is really to just find either a group or friends or routes that you really enjoy doing. Um, if you love to run on the treadmill, like run on the treadmill. If you love to run a similar route, like find a place that you love to go or, or, or go find a new trail or something that, that keeps it interesting. Some people think like, oh, well, I'm not running here. I'm not running there. I love to run like here or there. Like just do what you want to do and run in the places and the people that you want to run with. And that just makes training even, even more fun. So if you have this consistency and you have the structure and then you really want to go out and, and see these places and enjoy it, then, then you're good to go. And then you're willing to run slow because you're in a great place. So you're willing to be consistent because you know you're going to meet up with your friend tomorrow morning at five o'clock and, and you don't want to be late or you don't want to be that person called out. Um, yeah, and if you can follow those three things, you're, you're pretty much golden. How hard is it for you to finish a run and not dip into a brewery? I mean, uh, I have so much beer in my fridge from all these different places. I pretty much have one at my house, but like. <laughs> well, I would say in your house, you could literally walk out to any brewery. Yeah, right? I mean, I can walk to the festival behind me or wherever. I mean, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty awesome to be able to. I've done it before. I mean, 100%. Like, we've yeah. done and like, end up at a brewery where, I mean, there's so many in Bomberg. Like, I'm not, I'm not even kidding. There's so many. <laughs> so, like, I could just stop where I usually stop and walk home. So, I like to walk for, like, 10 minutes after my I finish. I just enjoy that cool down. Mm -hmm. I literally stop, like, in front of this super old brewery that's been there from, like, 1500, and they brew this, like, smoked beer. And I could just stop and get one if I wanted to and walk <laughs> home. But I've done it, for sure. <laughs> so, it's, it's not terribly hard because I, I definitely do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's awesome. Chris, hey. anything? Go ahead. I do not. I have nothing else. Ryan, anything else you want to plug or talk about or? No, I mean, I think, I think the biggest thing, and I had a conversation with my real, my, my actual work boss the other day about it is like, there's a difference between running and like training. And so what I think people, what I think people forget and what they, they um, miss out on is it's okay to do either or. You can just run to run and be able to run it and like, or be able to have fun and go with your friends and not worry about getting faster, or slower, or do whatever. And like, that's just as valid as like training 16 weeks super hard for a race. Um, people should just want to get out and be able to move. Even if you can't run, run walk, like be able to go out and just move your body. But if you then decide that you want to get serious about improving and taking on a race, then you have to think more strategically about what you're actually doing because the structure of running this 80, 20 things being consistent all makes sense in terms of making you faster. It's just like playing the guitar. Like if you only want to play stairway to heaven and like learn one song or just like screw around, screw around. But like, if you really want to get good, then you have to learn chords and progressions and things. So you have to think about it differently. So run the way that you want to run, but realize that if you want to take that next step, think about it a little bit more, find a coach, find read up or whatever and ask questions. And you always can reach out to me if you ever wanted to, but uh, be able to, to take advantage of that and take it to the next level. And if not, just enjoy your runs and be happy with it. Cool. That's such, such great, great advice, man. And, and I think, you know, your point when you said reaching out to you, you know, my final question is where can people find you get, get in contact with you? Yeah. Is, it, is it social media, email, whatever? Yeah, so the uh, the coaching company that I, I still have running is Miles to Go Endurance. It sounds just like it sounds, Miles to Go Endurance. So I'm Ryan, Ryan at Miles to Go Endurance.com. You can find us on our website, uh, LinkedIn, Instagram. I'm kind of all over the place, but the easiest way is, is to just find us on, on there. And it's just me. So if you want to email me and ask me any sort of coaching questions, feel free. I'm more than happy to, to answer and, and help out in any way that I can. Cool. Ryan, thanks a lot. We really appreciate you being on. Yeah, no, thanks so much. Take, yeah, take care, thanks, everybody. Brian.
Yeah, thanks, guys. And that brings another episode of We Run This to a Close. Nick and I want to thank everybody for listening. If you love the podcast, please share it with friends or leave a review on iTunes. And remember to follow Nick and I on social media. He's at It's Nick Domingo, and I'm at Chris Luminati on Twitter. Or follow us both on Instagram at We Run This underscore pod. Until next time, see everybody out there.